Um, so, so thank you all, uh, and thank you again for inviting me. Um, what I will try to do in uh, hopefully not more than uh, 20 minutes um, is to share with you how do we see um, the, um, the current uh, threat and trends relating to uh, terrorist use of technology. A um, few words on um, the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, also known as CITED. CITED is a, security, is a UN Security Council body that, is, ha that has three tasks, basically. The first one is to go and assess how countries uh, comply with all the UN Security Council resolutions related to terrorism, and they are very broad and comprehensive. Second is to provide the UN Security Council and the international community with recent trends relating to terrorism, identify what's coming up, what are we seeing, and alert uh, the international community. And the third one is to provide expert advice and policy advice to the UN Security Council, and the three missions complement each other and feed, uh, uh, feed from each other. So, um, terrorism and technology have a short history. For many years, terrorism was a very low-tech industry. Uh, those of you who are old enough may remember that the first time we've seen uh, terrorism use technology was in the old days when Al-Qaeda used to drop um, videos, um, cassettes, uh, in front of Al Jazeera's offices in Doha, and they were promulgated through Al Jazeera to the entire world. So that was the, the first and main way in which terrorist organizations used the technology of, the, of those days. And if you were uh, patient enough and had the time to listen to two hours of lectures from El Zawiri and theological arguments made by him, you might end that up being recruited to Al Qaeda. That was in the early uh, 2000. Um, we lived like that till 2014, and 2014 is what I describe as di ter digital terrorism 2.0, where we actually have seen ISIL, Daesh, able to master existing technologies. And bear in mind that we, when we're talking about terrorism, we usually, and this is, will be the focus of my presentation, about the way they can use existing technologies. Um, and Daesh was able to master all the technologies that were there in order to recruit some 70,000 people to join its cause. That was something that the world was unprepared. Um, technology companies were unprepared. Um, the UN was unprepared. Member states were not prepared. But it was extremely effective, one of the most successful mobilization campaign. What have they, they have done since then? They were able, and I spoke about it earlier, they were able to use technology throughout the entire cycle of terrorism, which begin with radicalization, and you could see the high quality clips that they were producing. There were not two hours of speeches, there were three minutes of very effective clip. They were able to recruit people. Once people were exposed to those messages, they were taking them down to private chat house, to uh, chat rooms where they were able to recruit them. They were able to uh, finance activities uh, through uh, cryptocurrencies and other new payment methods. And then they were able to coordinate and perpetrate the attack using instant messaging and encrypted uh, communication and has happened in, on the 13th of November uh, in Paris. So what we're seeing is the entire terrorism cycle moved since 2014-15 from a low-tech industry to a high-tech industry where tools that exist for all the good reasons that we enjoy using them are being used by terrorist organizations and are using a, in quite an effective way. Oops, sorry. I talked in the previous uh, session in the panel about some of the responses, but I want to say a few words about 
one of the most interesting responses that we developed together with the four big companies, um, uh, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, that basically uh, agreed to work together despite all their other differences. They agreed that on the issue of terrorism content, they will work together. And what they agreed through this forum, GIFCT, and it's one of its um, spin-offs, uh, Tech Against Terrorism, is to do the following. First, to create a common terms of uh, service platform, meaning the terrorists will not be able to use the platform. And the common terms of service is agreed by all four companies, as far as it relates to terrorism content. Second, they agreed to develop tools based on many of the technologies that we have seen here today talked to make sure that terrorist content will not be uploaded. Two main technologies that I will uh, stress here. One is hashing technology. The same technology that was used for child pornography is now being used in order to take down content before it's uploaded. So one, whenever one of the companies identified a terrorism content, they will hash it and um, will be able to and share it with the other companies so none of them will have to decide whether it's terrorism content or not. It's just being taken uh, down. And then the other tool, something that was discussed uh, extensively in previous panels, is the use of AI. Terrorism, unlike child pornography, is a much more nuanced and context-specific uh, material. One can upload a, a very violent um, a clip, but it could be a researcher who trying to explain an argument about ISIS ideology. Another one could be a journalist that is reporting on ISIL activities. And it's very difficult to train machines to understand that nuance. And the companies are working and working more and more effectively. It was mentioned how many languages they have to understand, I think, in the previous a panel, and they eventually also rely at the, at the end of the process on human moderation that decides what is actually terrorism content and what is not. That knowledge, uh, that AI, is being shared between the four uh, companies. And a third uh, tool that is developed by the Global Forum is the Tech Against Terrorism that we, our office, is leading. The idea is not to keep the knowledge human knowledge as well as technology limited to the four companies, but to spread the knowledge to other companies. And Tech Against Terrorism is an initiative that brings together startups from all over uh, the world. And any of you who, are, uh, uh, who is a startupist and in interested in being involved, there are opportunities to do there. We run workshops all around uh, the world. If any of you wants to contact me and make sure that I put you in touch with our coordinator, we will be happy to do so. Many companies have joined. One uh, upside to do, to do so is to have direct contacts with the major four companies uh, and their willingness to listen to any technology that you have developed that will make that complex process uh, um, more easy for them. And I know several companies that thought that they have Technolog technologies that could help in this com global exercise and through tech against terrorism were able to get access to the four companies, share with them their knowledge and see how they could join forces. Now tech against terrorism and the global forum are extremely effective uh, tools. Now the global forum has also spun off another initiative that we are supporting which will be called the global, uh, research, uh, the global Research Network on Technology and Terrorism. It's led by Brooking Institute and RUSI. We launched it uh, two weeks ago in Washington, and many other, many other think tank and NGOs who are researching the new ways, the new and innovative ways that terrorists use technology are able to partner to get access to the latest in what researchers identify in this space, but also make sure that that research feeds into the work of the platforms. I wish I could have said that this is a w wonderful solution and we solve the problem. The reality is that we not. We know that more than 
of uh, terrorist content on the major platforms is taken down before it's uploaded, but the byproduct of it is that terrorists are using smaller uh, platforms or are much less regulated and much less resourced to be able to continue the work. It's not uh, necessarily a bad thing because one research that we have seen coming out a few weeks ago suggests that by making this move from a bigger platform, let's say Facebook, to a much less recognized platform, on average, the organization will lose 90% of their followership, meaning that instead of having 100,000 people following a specific a channel on YouTube, they will go down to 1,000. One, uh, 1, that is effective, that is important, but still, as I said, doesn't solve the problem. It's a cat and mouse. We have to continue developing technologies. We have to bring many of the platforms on board. I could share with you one platform. I don't know how many of you have heard of the company Just Paste It. Some of you. I see in nodding. This is a company that is a one-man show. It's a one person, a Polish guy, a terrific guy, that developed a, basically a, 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 a digital just paste it. When you go, remember, there were days when you go to a, a, a youth hostel and you wanted to leave a note to your friend. You just left a note. I'll meet you tomorrow at that coffee shop. See you later. I went to the restaurant. Meet me at 7 p.m. These were the old days before we all had smartphones. He developed a platform that allows you to do it on the platform. You could leave an anonymous uh, note to your friend, meet me at the coffee shop. It's completely anonymous. He's a one person and he's doing it aside from his day job. The problem is that terrorists identify that platform as a wonderful tool to be able to communicate with each other. And the guy is completed the loss. He suddenly found law enforcement agencies from all over the world chasing him and telling him you are supporting terrorism. And he said, I never intended it to be so, but this is what happened. I have conversations and post-its on my platform in 25 languages, 24 of which I don't even speak. And that's the reality. So we brought Just Paste It to the Tech Against Terrorism platform and we're working with him and law enforcement agencies are cooperating with him and helping that one person to be able to do a better job. A little bit of a look into the future. And when I said a look into the future, my conversation will be perhaps less futuristic than many of the conversations uh, we had here. I will try to focus in um, the, uh, the second part of my presentation on threats and trends that we're seeing that could be you actually utilized today if terrorist organization decides. So I cannot speak about technologies that may be, or risk that we'll be facing five or 10 years from now. I'm sure there are people who are uh, doing it, but I wanna focus on few trends and risks that we're seeing it. One of them, the first one is IoT. As you know, there are around 30 billion IoT devices around the world, and the pace of growth is that IoT devices double they uh, are every four years. So in three, four more years from now, there will be 60 billion. And just imagine how much we will be surrounded by IoT uh, devices. I was chairing uh, a year ago uh, um, a working group of the World Economic Forum on the safety and security of IoT. And one of the issues we looked at is what threats we're seeing there. So the threats are real. The reason is that most IoT devices are either non-secured at all, or if secured, secured in a very lax manner, meaning that if a terrorist organization is committed to trying to penetrate the system through IoT device, the technology is out there and it's not so complicated to do that. Can they do something behind denial of service or those kind of, or defacing uh, platforms? Technology is out there. Um, those of you who followed know that there was already a kinetic attack committed through IoT devices, the famous Stucknox attack that was committed through IoT device, and since then the technology itself has been leaked. So if a terrorist organization is committed enough to use IoT device in order to eventually perpetrate a kinetic um, attack, that is possible, that is one of the trends 
and possible threats we're seeing. A second one, a conversation that we didn't have today, but this is another very real threat, is the use of 3D, uh, 3, um, 3D printing. Today, the code for, um, um, for producing, for printing a gun is available. It's not just available, it's uh, available in the US and protected under the First Amendment, meaning a per the person who um, developed that code um, at the FBI tried to take it down, but under court proceedings, um, he was forced to allow the person to share the code with whoever he want as part of uh, his freedom of expression. So basically, if someone really wants to print a gun made of plastic that will probably uh, pass every, uh, almost every security uh, at airport or in concert centers, um, Sorry, two more minutes? Okay, I'll, I'll run very quickly. Um, you got it, I hope. Another thir uh, third is cyber attacks that have results in the real uh, world. I will highlight two. One is attacks against the grid that are fi uh, possible, and another is possible hacking of the, either the shipping industry or the aviation industry. The aviation industry is more or less secured and much more aware of the threats it being posed, exposed to. The maritime security is lagging years behind. The average age of a cargo uh, ship is 24 years. The technology that's running it is very outdated, very insecure. And just imagine what can it be if an oil tanker in, for example, the Malaga Straits or in Gibraltar Straits is taken down and the impact on world economy on, uh, if this being done by a terrorist organization. Uh, I'm running very quickly um, to attacks against nuclear facilities. Those of you who remember in 2016, the attack on the, on the airport in Brussels may know that originally the perpetrators tried to attack the nuclear plant in Brussels. They followed and surveyed the chief scientist of the, uh, of, the, of the plant, hoping through him to get inside, meaning that at the level of intention, terrorist organizations will try to get the trophy of attacking a nuclear site. How can they do it if not through physical attacks? Well, this is a tool that was already weaponized by ISIL, these are the ISIL tool, the, the tool of drones. Drones can be used for any purpose. They could be used uh, to attack uh, and have been used by ISIL. They've been uh, weaponized by ISIL and used in combat. Nothing prevents a terrorist organization from uh, actually weaponizing a drone and trying to hit any conventional or unconventional um, target. Was it tried successfully already? The sad reality is that yes, in 2018, Greenpeace, in order to show the, the level of unsafety of nuclear plants, was able to, um, um, to land a drone at the center of a nuclear plant in France, meaning the technology is completely there, the risks are there, and hopefully um, nothing will, that we will see in the future. I'm running very quickly. Just to conclude uh, that not everything is bad and not everything is grim, there are many, many things that we can do. The first one is be vigilant. Technologies are not developed with a view to how terrorists will be using it against us. This is not how the technology world operates, but technology companies need to be more and more aware that there could be unintended usages of the technology that they have developed. There was much talk earlier about, uh, about smart regulation. I could only echo that message. We need more and more smart regulation, and there are many good practices that were shared earlier today by our, by our colleague from Yale University. That's really something that we at the UN try to support. Development of good practices. I mentioned the IoT protocol that we developed. We're also developing now and thinking through the GCTF, another forum on the use of drones and how can we better protect our societies from the use of drones uh, by terrorists and so on and so forth. We developed 
a very, I think, a very good manual on uh, biometric technology, and this is something that we're constantly invested in trying to bring more knowledge out there and to make everyone aware. Sharing experience, public-private partnership are also key. You cannot solve those problems just by governments or by uh, intergovernmental forum. The knowledge, the technology, the resources even exist within the private sector. We need to bring them to the table. We're investing enormous efforts in having healthy conversations with the private companies. And my participation here is one attempt to create more and more opportunities for private companies to engage with the UN on those issues. And lastly, that was the topic of our last session, but I could only reiterate it. No solutions that will not respect human rights in the design of them will be able to uh, solve our problems. It could only, uh, at best, um, keep us one or two years ahead, but eventually will not pay off. I think I ran my time, and I see that I did. Um, probably there's no time for Q&A, uh, so I'll, I'm back to you. As was said, thank you very much for listening, and thank you for coming.